Hi students, this is Academic Pentathlon Art and Music Video A on Art Fundamentals. Please make sure you have your booklet open as well as your highlighter or pen so you can go ahead and read through the pages. We're going to be doing pages 6 through 16, I believe. This was your homework assignment and it is due by the time you get back when we have our next meeting on Friday. Please make sure that you understand and you study all of the information that I'm going to be explaining today. On our next meeting, January 20th, we will be doing a little assessment at the very beginning of class. So it's very important that you study and understand all of the content I will be going over in this um, video as well as in the next video that I will be posting later this week. Let's go over the homework very quickly. It says watch videos A and B. Sorry about the late upload. I hope you understand it's the holiday season. Also, please make sure that you create your note cards for the art and music element terms. You can have multiple terms to one note card. And it also says to read the pages and study all the elements, 1 through 30. I'm going to be discussing pages 1 through 16 on this video and then 17 through 30 in the next video. Just by watching this video with your booklet open, you're already doing the first checkbox and probably the third and fourth one as well. But I'd suggest that before you come to class on Friday, January 20th, you should review all of the information in pages 1 through 30 because we will be doing a little test. All right, let's get started. Art history. What is art history? Many people think that art history is simply looking at the history of an art piece, but there's so much more involved. When you're looking at art history, it's actually a field of study dedicated to understanding the social, cultural, and economic context in which an artwork was created. If you look at this slide on the screen, it says social, cultural, economic. What, does those things, what do those things mean? Well, I know most of you guys probably think of social as like friends and community, and you're kind of correct. So social might be the hierarchy, like for example, in one society, there may be people in certain social classes, uh, like the peasants versus the aristocrats in um, uh, old England, or you can have different governments and politics. So a place that has a democratic government versus a place that has a monarchy may have a very different form and function in terms of the art that they produce. And there's also community systems. What did the men versus the women do? What did the old versus the young do? What kinds of priorities were important in that community, in the social situation? All of those elements within the social bullet point will affect the type of art that was created. The second component is cultural. We all know that cultures mean ethnicities, it means like things like the foods and traditions and belief systems and even the religious practices of a group of people. Religion and culture is a huge part of art. If you look at most of the major religions around the world, you'll know that they have created so many different paintings and sculptures and other kinds of artifacts that will help them worship their God that they believe in. Just looking at the Christianity, the religion of Christianity, you'll notice that there's many, many iterations or versions of uh, the Virgin Mary or of the crucifixion of Jesus or of the Last Supper. All of these are different ways that people embed religion into their art because art really is just an expression of what you believe in and who you are and how you identify yourself and your experiences in this world. The third bullet point is economic. Economic means money, income, or financial significance. A lot of artwork was created actually as ways to trade. So people or civilizations would be able to get the resources they need by trading special sculptures and jewels and all kinds of things that they could create with their hands um, that are artistic representations of their society. And later on, when art wasn't just the only thing that people traded, it became a revenue maker. So for example, you could have people commission an artist to draw a portrait of their family. This is before photography. So people in the upper class, wealthy aristocrats and people um, in the uh, governing bodies such as kings and queens and uh, important people would uh, commission artists and sculptors to represent themselves so that they could hang it on their wall. So it was also uh, an element of prestige 
something that creates reputation and makes you known as someone who is wealthy or powerful in a society. And then obviously today in modern times, um, acquiring art is also an element of wealth. So people who are very wealthy will acquire or collect a lot of art pieces. Sometimes they may even donate them to museums. Art sells for very high prices, so the economic aspect of art is definitely something that we should look into when we're looking at all of the various factors that influence why an artist created the thing he or she did create and what the art is supposed to express. Now, something that's very important for us to understand is context. And I'm going to use this word very often. Context means the environment. It can be the situation or all of the surrounding elements that influence something. By the way, I'm still on page six right now. Every time I talk about information that's on a new page, I'll let you guys know. So you should still be looking at page six. So moving on, I created this little diagram here to show you guys what art history really is. In order to properly study a work of art, it is important to understand what influences it and what it influences. What I mean by that is there's this relationship between art and all of the various factors that surround it. It's not just that those factors affect art. Art also affects those various factors. So for example, politics, let's talk about that. If a king creates or wants to have a portrait made of himself, then he will definitely influence the art of his kingdom by having the best sculptor or the best artist capture his most prestigious look with his best robes and his strongest uh, stature with his most impressive stallion and all of his jewels adorning him. The reason why he would want to have a portrait uh, created that shows him in that way is because he wants to then influence how people view him. He wants his entire kingdom, all of the people of his kingdom, to see him as somebody who is respected and admirable and strong. And so in that way, art is influenced by the king, and the king is influenced by the art. This is especially pertinent and relevant to the World War II era because we know that art was definitely used as propaganda. If you haven't learned what propaganda is, it's where people control information through a means of art or entertainment or music, but mostly during the time of the Nazi regime, Hitler and his propaganda minister would use things like posters and films and music to influence the way that people viewed the Nazi regime as something positive and something that would help their nation. In the same way, Americans also had their own form of propaganda as well. So art affecting politics and politics affecting art is especially relevant, especially during the time of the 1930s and 40s during the World War II era, which is exactly what we're studying today. The same thing happens with all of the various factors that surround art, whether it's the social aspects, which I discussed earlier, geographical, which means how big the land is, what's in that land. So for example, in certain places, you have more access to things like soapstone, which is a very for example, in certain places, you may have a lot of access to marble, like in the ancient Greek and Roman times. And so many of the sculptures that were created during those times were made up of marble and granite and stone. Um, in other places, they may have more access to pigments and dyes, like in India. So there may be more emphasis on color, right? So the geographical elements also affect the art, as well as religious, which I discussed earlier, and economic. Now, I know that you're thinking, man, Miss Park is speaking for a really long time on just the first page. Well, don't worry. I'm going to be discussing everything on pages 6 and 7 for most of this video. And then with the elements of art, I'll be able to go through those very quickly because those are very simple to remember. But I really want to spend some time understanding art history because I think this is a crucial foundational element here. If you understand what art history is and why we're doing this and what it entails, then I think you'll be better off um, understanding the rest of the content for this course. In addition to looking at the social, cultural, and economic context of an art work, art historians will also be looking at two other things. Number two, they'll be looking at qualities or functions of the artwork. 
What that means is sometimes um, when you look at an artwork, you really do have to look at the medium that they're using. Oftentimes the medium will affect what they're trying to communicate. Watercolor versus oil paint, pastel versus uh, marble, or printmaking versus photography. All of these have different qualities and uh, may even affect the function. Uh, for example, sometimes you'll have a function that is completely different than what you would have imagined. When you look at a piece of artwork, you may not think, oh, this is a commercial to sell something. But oftentimes, when there's a person behind that artwork, for example, somebody in high power asking the artist or photographer or poster printmaker to create something to express or portray or advertise an idea or a product, then it j just changes the entire function. And sort of instead of the artist trying to express himself, it's actually the artist delivering a product that reflects who is behind it, right? And then in other situations, you'll have artists purely expressing their views on this world and their experiences in life through their painting or their sculpture or their performance art. The third thing we're going to be looking at is the intentions or perspectives of the artist. This is kind of related to what I just mentioned earlier. It can be the life experiences, what was going on in society during that time, or even the past experiences of the artist that may affect how he portrays whatever he wants to portray um, on that canvas or in that sculpture. Now, continuing on to the second paragraph of page six, it, as an academic discipline, art history arose in the mid-18th century. However, art was analyzed and written about long before then. The ancient Roman historian Pliny the Elder sought to analyze historical and contemporary art in his text, Natural History. During the Renaissance, the author and artist Giorgio Vasari gathered the biographies of great Italian artists, past and present, in his document called The Lives of the Artists. Vasari's text provides us with insights into the changing roles of artists in society during this period and the developing concept of artistic genius. So we know that art history, even though it became an actual discipline, not until the mid-18th century, which means the 1700s, um, we know that before that it was still something that people sought to study. All right, now let's move on to the definition of art. This is the third paragraph on page six that starts with modern day art historians. So what is art defined as? Well, um, on the slide it states, almost any kind of visual material that is created by people that has special meaning and or is valued by overall appearance. So if I were you, I would definitely highlight that. Once again, it's almost any kind of visual material that is created by people that has special meaning and or is valued by overall appearance. There's two kinds of art. There's fine art, which means paintings, prints, drawings, sculptures, and architecture. And then there's today's art, which might be textiles, which are like rugs and carpet quilts, pottery, ceramic art, tattoos even, posters, advertisements, furniture, film, and any kind of medium that portrays a story through visual means which is the definition of art. Now on to page seven. So what influences how we view or understand the art? The meaning of a work of art can shift over time and it can be interpreted differently by viewers with various points of view. Differences in social status, education, religious background, race, and gender can affect how people interpret a work of art. For example, Michelangelo's paintings on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel would have had a very different meaning for the Pope who commissioned the work and the worker who cleaned the floors of the chapel. Similarly, the work's meaning to a Protestant, that's somebody who is Christian but is not Catholic, a Muslim, or atheist today would be very different than its meaning to a member of the Catholic faith back in the 16th century. At the same time, all four of these people might admire the chapel ceiling equally. In other words, there may be more than one meaning of a work of art, and those meanings may change as time passes. Even if you're not a Catholic person, you may look at the beautiful paintings of the Sistine Chapel and stand there in awe of the beauty and the technique of the painting. You don't necessarily have to understand the spiritual and faith-based sides in the meaning of the painting, because he did paint images from the, that are biblical. All right, let's move on to the next paragraph. While studying the meaning of a work of art, art historians use formal and contextual analysis. 
Formal analysis focus on what is seen upon examining the artwork itself, while contextual analysis looks for meaning in the cultural, social, religious, and economic context in which the work was produced. So in other words, the formal analysis is looking with your eyes. What do your eyes see? Appearance, observation, descriptions, and contextual is that diagram I showed you earlier. It's all of those various factors that will influence the meaning of the work itself. So the, those are the two ways that artists will look at the meaning of a work of art. Okay, let's move on to the next paragraph. Art historians often begin their analysis with a close examination of a work of art. Ideally, they will examine the original work of art because some qualities can be lost in the reproduction process. In the case of sculpture, it is often difficult to comprehend the length, width, and height of a piece from a photograph. Just like in the image you see on your screen, it's hard to understand that that uh, sculpture by Gio Clementi is actually not that big. It's about the size of maybe one and a half rulers tall but you would never know it if you just looked at the photograph on your left. When paintings are copied, we often lose the texture and some of the rich colors of the original work. Even copies of photographs can appear flatter because they lose the slight variations of light and dark. When I was a senior in college at UCLA, I was an art history minor and we used to study many of Manet's paintings in quite detail because that was the concentration that I focused on. I looked at um, 19th century uh, French art. And so by looking at those paintings, I thought I knew everything I had to know about those paintings because I had to write papers on them and everything. But I had a chance to go to Paris and go to a museum where they house many of those paintings by Edouard Manet. And I was in shock. I could not believe how different the painting looked like in real life compared to the reproductions or actually the photographs of those paintings that my professor would project on the slideshows. It was quite a stark difference. I had expected something to be medium sized and have a lot of texture. However, when I looked at the painting itself, it was so smooth and the painting was almost as big as the entire wall of that one gallery space. So what I'm trying to say is that oftentimes the original painting is going to look very different from a picture that you see of that painting that your teacher would maybe post on a slideshow or you'll see on a website. And that's why I included this picture of a very famous painting by Monet, by Claude Monet, called Water Lilies. Most people just see a little snapchat. Wow, I said snapchat, guys. Most people often see a little snapshot of the big painting because you can't capture all of it. It's like a 360 panoramic room. Do you guys see that? That's the Museum de Orangerie in Paris. And basically, when you walk in, you'll see that the entire circular, ovular-shaped gallery has the water lilies on it. And it's really hard to see every single aspect of that painting all in one place without being in that space. Like, you cannot capture every single aspect of this painting and put it on a slideshow, right? So in other words, it's really important to see the original work of art if you want to truly understand something. Unfortunately, it is not always practical for art historians to access original artwork. In some cases, works of art might be damaged or even lost over time, so art historians must sometimes rely on descriptions by others during their analysis. Art historians also review any associated studies like sketches or models, etc., and other works by the artist during the process. That's why I've included a couple of images here. Um, you'll see on the left side a painting that has been completely damaged over time, you know, with heat or erosion or moisture, these things naturally happen. And there's also a picture of like cave paintings. Those will also fade over time, and many of those places are where uh, it's restricted to people. You can't just go in there and look at it like a museum. Um, only archaeologists and certified people can go into those spaces, so you wouldn't be able to actually see the original cave paintings. And also, unfortunately, sometimes things happen, like war. Um, this is a picture of a museum in Baghdad, Iraq, where archaeological um, artifacts were actually destroyed because of the war. And so that's a really huge shame since this is like thousands of years of history that is just crumbled upon, right? And the only way that future generations can study these artworks that used to be at this place in Iraq is just through photographs and people's accounts of them, unfortunately. So sometimes you can't actually see the real work itself. In order to complete a contextual analysis, art historians usually search archives or libraries for documents related to a work of art. 
I actually worked at one of these spaces called the Getty Research Institute. If you look at that picture on the top right hand corner, it looks like a big white beautiful building. That was actually called the Getty Research Institute. It's next to the Getty Museum next to UCLA and that's where I worked part time when I was a sophomore, junior, and senior in college. I st sat in there in the library and I would proofread all of the different things that the editors did. It was a very boring job but kind of fun in a weird way because you were surrounded by art and you got to really see all of the amazing information, all of the documents and artifacts and archives of photographs and paintings and things that people can't just normally see. These are all archived and stored and protected in like perfectly air-conditioned drawers and things like that. And so when art historians want to look something up, they need to go to these institutes and ask permission and then they have to spend hours upon hours searching and looking at it, kind of like a detective. And they would also have to look at the original labels or the receipts of sale. I included a receipt here by Marcel Duchamp um, on the left side from 1912. Can you believe that? And it sold for 374 uh, whatever the money was in France during that time. It wasn't the euro. Um, I'm pretty sure that that same thing that he sold would go for millions upon millions of dollars today. And then also you'll see sketches and museum clippings and letters and journal uh, entries. All of these different things will help the art historian understand what the art meant and what the art actually means. Elements of art, formal qualities of art. While it is important to examine any given work of art in its historical context in order to arrive at an understanding of its meaning, the basic visual components of a work of art also need consideration. These include line, shape, form, space, color, and texture, among other things. Formal analysis requires careful observation and description often using terms unique to the field of art. Line is the most basic of art elements. The strip definition of a line is the path of a point moving towards space. Lines have a variety of characteristics such as length, width, and direction. Lines may appear hard or soft, bold or blurred, constant or variable in width. Let's move on to the last paragraph on page 7. Artists use lines to express ideas or feelings visually. Horizontal and vertical lines can create a stable feeling, but vertical lines cause the eye to move upward. Because of this, medieval churches were created with very high arch ceilings designed to raise people's eyes upward toward heaven to promote a feeling of spiritual awe, so they're looking up towards God. Horizontal lines, such as the line of the horizon, on the page, suggest a feeling of peace and tranquility while curving and jagged lines create a sense of activity and action. Earlier, we discussed the function of art. If you look at some of those examples of the architectural works on the right side, like the Parthenon and the uh, pyramids, then you understand that the lines that are included in those architectural buildings, whether it's pointing up to one point in the pyramid or a bunch of strong pillars moving up with the very horizontal kind of of triangle at the very top, all of these lines represent something and evoke a message into, onto the people of the societies that they were in. So lines, even though they may seem like just, you know, a line with a pencil, actually have a lot of significance in shaping the meaning of what is portrayed, whether it's through a structural building or through a painting or a sketch. Shape describes an object's two-dimensional area, while an object's form is three-dimensional and has length, width, and depth. In other words, shape equals 2D and form equals 3D. For example, square, a square is a shape, but a cube, which is the 3D version of a square, is a form. In the same way, if a circle is a shape, what would be the form? It would be a sphere. Some shapes and forms may be categorized as geometric, such as circles and spheres and squares and cubes. These are geometric shapes and forms are precise and regular. However, there's other shapes and forms that are considered organic. Not everything looks like a geometric shape, right? Imagine like a flower or a tree or a leaf. Because living things tend to be flexible and irregular in shape or form, a geometric shape or form can convey a sense of order and stability, while organic shapes and forms tend to express movement and rhythm. Space is an element of art related to the organization of objects and the areas around them. The objects, shapes, or forms in an artwork make up its positive space, as you can see in the image I provided. Um, 
So the main thing that you're looking at might be the uh, urn or the vase looking thing this in the center, right? Or in other people's minds, the positive space can actually be the two people looking at each other. So this is kind of a little play on positive and negative space. It's interchangeable in these two uh, examples that I've shown you. Um, so on the other hand, the area around the main object of the composition of that piece is actually called the negative space. Perspective. When artwork is two-dimensional, artists often use a group of techniques that are called perspective. Artists utilize perspective when they want to provide the illusion of depth. So for example, you'll see that the people in the foreground, the people with the umbrellas, are closer to you versus the building in the back, right? That's an example of perspective. And you can control this by using lines and by slanting the lines. Instead of just showing a bunch of buildings all in the front, you can see the road that goes towards a point, like at the top or the tip of a triangle on the little sketch on the top right hand corner. And then there's also like bird's eye view because the way that you see something is gonna change your perspective of what you see, right? So the uh, picture on the very bottom of the buildings on the right hand bottom side of that slide is of a bird's eye view perspective. Next is color. Color is a central element in art and it's more complex than one might think. And yes, you do have to know which colors mix to make which colors. That was one of the quiz bowl questions last year, so you do have to study this part. There are three primary colors of pigment, red, blue, and yellow. And a fancy word for color in art history is called hue, H-U-E. The three primary colors are red, blue, and yellow, from which all other pigment colors are produced. You can create every single color out of these three primary colors. Secondary colors are what happens when you mix two primary colors. So for example, when you mix red and yellow, it makes orange. When you mix yellow and blue, it makes green. Blue and red makes violet. Then there are tertiary, which is a fancy word for three colors. There's six of them. What are those? Well, that's what happens when a secondary color, like purple, is mixed with one of its primary colors. So for example, red and violet make red violet, and violet and blue make violet blue, and blue and green make blue green, and green and yellow make yellow green. Yellow and orange make yellow orange, you get the point. So I've shown you guys a color wheel here, and something you do have to know is intensity. One quality all colors possess is intensity, which refers to the brightness or the purity of the color. So if it's super bright, it's more intense. If it's dull or not so bright, it's less intense. Let's move on to page 9 at the very top. Um, primary colors of red, yellow, and blue are pure in color, right? Because they don't have anything mixed in. So they're actually the most intense colors. Whenever pure colors are mixed with neutrals or other hues, they become less intense. If complementary colors such as red and green are mixed using equal parts, the result will be a dull, muddy brown tone. So that's why when we say if you mix all the colors, it'll become brown, it's true because it becomes less intense because there isn't one pure pigment, right? If artists want to mix a darker or lighter shade of a color, they can add black or white. That's when you call it a neutral. So you can get red, you can get purple, you can get any color and add a black or white and it'll become a neutral color. Um, and when you mix black and white together itself, it creates a variety of grays. When talking about the lightness or darkness of a hue or of the gray in an artwork, so when you're adding gray or when you're adding making something neutral, it's called value. An artist, an artwork's value may be mostly dark, mostly light, or maybe a variation from dark to light. Artists often use value to set the mood or tone of a work of art. So if you see that something's more gray, then it's probably because the artist wanted to portray something more depressing or a mood that's a little sadder instead of using bright or light colors. Also, certain color families can even be used to create space and movement in a piece. When discussing art and color, we often speak of warm colors and cool colors. Warm colors include red, orange, and yellow, like the colors of the sun or the sunset, and are referred to um, as such because we associate them with the warmth of the sun, while um, cool colors like green, blue, and violet remind us of cool forests, mountain lakes, and snow. So that's why we have warm and cool colors. And now let's move on to texture. Texture refers to how things feel or how we think they would feel if touched. From a young age, we explore the surfaces of things and store away these tactile, which means you touch them with your hands and your senses, experiences in our memory. So artists use actual textures in their art sometimes, and sometimes they just draw the texture. For example, a ceramic artist, that's somebody who makes pots and plates and things like that, 
um, may actually put like little holes or make it extra rough or make it super smooth so that they're creating actual texture. While other artists will create an illusion of texture. Now I'm on the uh, next column on page nine. Artists who work in two dimensional media create visual texture, an illusion of a textured surface. So they may create the texture of a straw hat or a glass vase just by using you know, their pencil or their uh, paintbrush and even the colors and the light that they use or the contrast between the darkness of the surface and the lightness of the, of the sun that shines upon that surface. In addition to using the aforementioned techniques to create visual texture, painters also can create actual texture using their brush strokes. So sometimes when they want to make the mountain look extra rough, they may just pile on the paint so it crusts over and creates a rocky, crusty texture. So it, it kind of, it's still 2D, but it's almost 3D. Next is composition, which is a term that describes the artist's organization of the elements of art in either two or three dimensional works. So basically everything on that page and how the artist decides to put it on the page. I included Picasso's Guernica mural in black and white right here because with murals, composition is incredibly important. Oftentimes, murals are stories that go from left to right. So you have to look at the composition carefully to understand the story and the meaning behind the mural. Next is rhythm, which is the principle that we associate with movement or pattern. Artists create a sense of rhythm in their composition by repeating elements such as line shape, color, and texture. Rhythm can also cause the viewer's eye to move rhythmically across and around the work of art. Some rhythms flow smoothly, while others are more jarring, they're more disruptive. So how do artists create rhythm again? With repetition. And you can create repetition through motif or pattern. A motif is a single instance of a repetitious pattern. So like one thing repeated over and over and over and over again, like in a quilt. Next is balance. Balance refers to the equal distribution of visual weight in a work of art. There are a number of techniques that artists use to create balance. The easiest of these is to, is to understand. The easiest of these to understand is symmetrical balance. You guys all know what symmetry means, right? You learned about those when you talked about uh, butterflies when you were in elementary school. When you fold a paper in half, it, it becomes symmetrical on either side, so it's equally balanced to each other. So that's why I included um, this one piece here because it's not necessarily completely balanced because there's very variations of balance. Now I'm on the next page on page 10. There's approximate symmetry. In this kind of balance, shapes or objects are slightly varied on either side of the central axis. So for example, in this poster called Balance, as you can see right here by Alexander Kahl something. Sorry about that, I can't read it. Um, you'll notice that it is semi-balanced, but that one black line on the left side, it kind of creates an off-balance look, but it's still pretty balanced. So we would give it an approximate symmetry uh, label. Now let's talk about a, um, a pro uh, asymmetrical balance. So as you can see, um, sometimes you'll have things that are completely asymmetrical. So You'll have the Mondrian drawing with the big red square is asymmetrical because if you cut it in half, it's not the same as opposed to the image on the top right hand corner. And even the image on top is semi-balanced approximately, right? And what about the image on the left um, by J uh, Jan Van Eyck? Uh, would you believe that this is uh, balanced with the uh, male and the female on either side um, in their marriage portrait? You can argue that, yeah, because if you cut it in half, or if you fold it over, the composition is pretty balanced on each side. Um, another element that is important to understand is focal point. Focal point is the element that contrasts with the rest of a composition. So your eye tends to rest at the focal point. What is the focal point in the photograph to the left? Probably the um, shorter uh, troop or soldier who is um, lined up right there where we can see his entire um, two eyes and nose. He's probably the focal point because everyone else is either obscured by view or there are they are out of focus, right? Um, then on the image on the right, we have the cottage with the sun that's shining directly upon the cottage. So the focal point would be the cottage. Nobody would argue like, oh no, the focal point is the tree on the very left side. No one would say that because your eyes just draw towards that cottage, which makes it the um, for the uh, focal point. And finally, we have proportion. And proportion and scale basically means the size relationship among the parts of a composition. Our sense of proportion is based upon our human scale. The term scale refers to the size of the entire work or to the size of the parts of a work in relation to the whole piece. 
Um, so for example, um, let's look at the painting, sorry, the photograph on the left side. This is an actual installation that's at the Broad Art Museum in downtown Los Angeles. You can actually go visit it. And you can see that there's a dinner table, a chair and table, or multiple chairs and a table. And it's much larger than the human being we see there, right? Or the clothespin. We normally see clothespins as tiny little things that can fit in the palm of our hands. But in this photograph, it's giant. It's a huge sculpture. Now I'm on the second uh, column of page 10. When representing the human face and figure realistically, artists strive to use accurate proportions, right? Obviously the paintings, the photographs that you see in front of you are not accurate proportions. They're oversized, like out of scale. But back in the Greek, um, ancient Greek times, when they used to make busts or uh, sculptures of people's faces, of very important people's faces 2,500 years ago, they made sure that the proportions were down to a T. They would even measure the human form and make sure everything was proportional because they believed that proportion meant beauty and it meant, and meant the ideal. And they decided that their art was to portray the ideal. Processes and techniques. In order to understand processes and techniques, you have to know two-dimensional versus 3D. I think you guys all know that. 2D is when you have something on flat paper, and 3D is when you can pretty much walk around the whole thing. It's something that protrudes, right? It's something that takes up space, like a sculpture or something like that, instead of uh, just a flat painting on a canvas, which is 2D. All right, I know this video is getting really long, so you can also take a break between the videos and just remember where you left off. But we just have one more section to continue, all right? So the very first technique is drawing. And you guys all know what drawing is. You've all probably drawn before. You use a pencil uh, or graphite. And there's many different um, techniques you can use when drawing. You can do shading to change the value, so darkness and lightest. Um, you can use hatching or cross-hatching, which is basically creating an illusion of depth. And you would be using lines uh, close together. Um, so I, ex I included a, a little diagram of what cross-hatching might look like. And there's also stippling, and stippling is when you create little dots. So you get your pencil and you just dot, 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 dot everywhere, and that would be a stippling effect. You don't only have to draw with a pencil. You can also draw with other things like colored pen uh, pencils or colored pastels, which became popular in the 1700s. So when you're thinking of drawing, it doesn't necessarily have to only relate to pencils, okay? All right, then, now let's move on to printmaking. Printmaking um, includes various processes such as relief prints, intaglio prints, lithographs, and screen prints. All of these processes use some sort of matrix or printing plate on which an image is created. In other words, for you guys to understand this better, it's like stamping. It's where you either engrave something into wood or metal plates and then you put a piece of paper on top and you roll something heavy over it so that it, it prints onto that piece of paper. Or um, there's other ways to do that too. Now let's talk about relief printing. Relief printing is where you cut away part of the surface of a plate, and so the parts that you didn't cut away are the parts that get stamped on the paper. Intaglio printmaking works in the opposite manner. In the intaglio process, lines are incised on the wood or soft metal plate. Carving tools are used to cut lines into the surface of the plate by engraving or by etching. Etch engraving is when you um, uh, use something like... Um, uh, a, a very sharp tool and then you you know cut into something and etching I, I believe is where you do that to something like glass or to metal all right so you know when you do printmaking it's like stamping okay in relief printing because all the parts that stick out are the parts that go on the paper well intaglio printmaking or engraving works the opposite way the parts that um, stick out don't go on the paper the parts that you cut like the little incisions you make are the parts that go on the paper. So you would make the incision very shallow and you would put the um, ink into those little shallow grooves. So only the shallow parts, the parts that are deep set, are the parts that get on the paper. That's the opposite of how a stamp works. I hope you guys understood what I just said. If not, I will show you guys a cool video on YouTube about the whole um, engraving and etching and printmaking process. Lithography, now on page, on page 12, is a process in which the image is drawn with a waxy pencil or a crayon directly on a plate, which can be made of stone or zinc or aluminum. And then um, in this situation, you don't have to like cut anything out because as you guys know, oil and water don't mix, right? So when you put ink on that little thing that you already drew, the ink does not touch wherever you put your wax um, on. So then basically everything that the wax does not touch becomes stamped on the paper. All right, let's move on to painting. 
painting. How few people make paint? You just need three things. You need pigment, which is shown in those super bright circular dishes. You need a binder, um, which is like a chemical that makes the paint stick with each other and makes it liquidy. And you need a solvent. Solvent like thins it out. Sometimes when you um, need to erase something and you can't, you can use a paint thinner like turpentine to um, thin the paint out to make it, you know, go away or to uh, get rid of a stain or something. But I wouldn't recommend it. It smells very powerful and it's quite a strong chemical that you probably shouldn't be using until maybe you're in high school or college. All right, now let's move on to fresco. A fresco is basically painting on a wall. And that Sistine Chapel um, example I showed you guys earlier is an example of a fresco. Um, frescoes are also used like when they create murals and um, anytime you go to a restaurant or even around Santa Ana and you see a lot of paintings just directly on the wall, those are called frescoes. Unfortunately, frescoes don't really last a long time unless you maintain them because they're usually outside and they get hit with the sun and the rain and things like that. Tempera is a water-based paint. If you're in Miss Pete's class, you most likely use tempera paint. That's a paint that is just, you know, regular old uh, paint that you would use in school. And then glazes are the types of paint that's thin, transparent, and when it uh, fires in a kiln or in an oven, um, because it's usually used on ceramic and pottery, um, it dries and it uh, is cured and it becomes very glossy and shiny. Um, so you can also have semi-transparent glazes as well just to make something super shiny looking. Now gouache is another type of paint. It's very similar to tempera but it's like the higher quality version. So let's just say like tempera paint is like Elmer's glue and gouache is like super fancy glue that you would use at like a construction site or something like that if you guys know what I mean, okay? All right, watercolor. You guys know what watercolor is. If you have to use water, to loosen the pigment and so whatever um, you paint actually has like a watercolor effect it spreads more easily because it saturates the paper and finally we have acrylic paint which is the strongest pigmented paint and um, when it dries it dries like hard plastic and you can even create uh, super uh, thick layers of, of, of acrylic and it'll dry like that um, they're not like oils, by the way. Oil paints are very different. Oil paints take forever to dry. Imagine if you spilled oil on a countertop and you waited for it to dry, right? Um, it, it, acrylic paints are the opposite of that. You have to, it dries so quickly, you, you have to be able to layer on top of each other because there's no way that it's going to stay um, still moist by the next day or even a couple hours later. And so when you use oil, when you use, I'm sorry, when you use acrylic paints, you have to dry the brushes like super quickly. All right, next is photography. You guys know what that is. Um, it was developed during the mid 19th century and it soon became a very popular way to document likenesses of people and scenes. So it occurred in, the, when I say mid 19th century, that actually means in the middle 1800s, right? And we're going to see that photography was a very big component in the art that was produced in the 1940s World War II um, era. Next, we have three-dimensional things like sculpture. Um, there's many types of sculpture. There's freestanding sculpture, so basically you can walk all around it. And then there's relief sculpture, which is shown in the image of the horses. That's You can't walk around it because if you walk behind that sculpture, you won't see the horses anymore, right? So a relief sculpture is when somebody carves into something so that the parts that stick out are not completely stuck out by themselves. So it's like half stuck out like the horses, if that makes sense, okay? If you think about like a penny or um, a nickel, those are kind of elements that you can pretty much say that they're kind of relief sculptures if you want to. Um, now I'm on to page 14. There's also carving. You can carve wood, you can carve clay, you can carve um, marble and stone as well. That's how some people make um, uh, sculptures and then there's also modeling instead of carving out of something modeling is when you stick things together so you can get clay and you have to like stick a whole blob on a piece of clay and make that the head and then you have to get a big chunk of clay and stick it on the top of the head and you have to shape the hair with that right so you're adding things together that's what modeling is very different from carving carving is taking away modeling is adding together cast form is really cool cast form is basically where you're using like metals or um, plaster and so you would basically create a sculpture and then you would create a um, plaster mold by putting all this plaster over your sculpture 
And then you can make hundreds and hundreds of copies of your sculpture because after the plaster dries and you take out your sculpture from inside, you can pour molten brass or molten metal and it'll dry into the shape of the actual plaster, which is the shape of the sculpture that you made. So that's another way of doing modeling. I'm sorry, of doing, um, so that's another way of doing sculpture. Next is environmental art or earthwork. This um, is basically where you create a, a large scale constructed on site piece that is usually not permanent and it has started to occur in the 1960s and this may occupy like a space like in a gallery or even outdoors or in a museum and it's just an installation. It's like a bunch of things that are uh, like installed in one place so to make a big impact but it's not going to be permanent like you can't just move it because the artist has to create that space within that room and um, if they want to move the piece the artist has to go to that another place and they have to reassemble the whole thing again so it's not something you can just carry in your arms um, next is performance art, which is a little bit weird actually, but I really think it's so cool. Um, it's weird in a cool way. It's where somebody performs something to express something. So here I've shown you three images of performance art. Sometimes artists want to portray silence or want to portray um, like awkwardness or they want to portray uh, thought or curiosity. And so the way that they'll do that is by sitting in a room with... Um, others or they'll have even interactions or they'll have like a string that connects two people and they'll just keep tugging at the string to show like distance or relationship or something. Those are all types of performance art. Next is craft and folk art. So those are like textiles and rugs and um, clay pots and glass bowls and any kind of things like that. Slip is the very soft type of clay that's watered down. It's kind of used as glue when you make pottery to make things go smoother and to make things stick better to each other. So these are craft and folk art. They're mostly associated with like traditions and things like that. Next is architecture, which is buildings. And there's post and lintel architecture, which is on the left bottom side, you'll see there's columns and there's horizontal elements. That's post and lintel. Um, it's a technique used in, especially in the past, like in the Greek Pan Parthenon, which you see on the right hand bottom, you'll see that there are many columns that are lifting up. So those are called the posts. And then the lintel is the part that's horizontal. And so this is a technique that's both structural um, and just something that has been repeated over and over again. Then we have different types of structures that include things like Art Deco, like the Chrysler Building, which is on the top center, or Gaudi's um, Cathedral, which is in Barcelona and has like organic structures. There's no post and lintel there, right? Then we have um, the St. Paul's um, uh, St. Peter's Basilica, which is on the bottom left hand next to the post and lintel construction with the dome shape. Um, and then we have the Pantheon, which is on the top left hand corner. So once again, guys, there's multiple ways of doing architecture and it has developed over time. It's a whole uh, course in itself. Um, but we do know that through the Industrial Revolution and the um, introduction of things like steel and uh, very important materials that can create skyscrapers, architecture has truly changed over time. Back then, they were only limited by stone and things like that. But now we have steel, which makes us a bit able, able to, uh, to build buildings maybe hundreds of, of stories high. right? And last but not least, we have mixed media. And mixed media is when artists can use multiple types of media, which include fabric, rope, broken dishes, newspaper, children's toys, plastic forks, anything. And they can make a collage of these things. So it's semi-three-dimensional, semi-two-dimensional. Here we have a few pieces by Roshan Berg, who's a very famous mixed media artist. And so, once again, this is just another technique of artists that they could use. Next is the section one summary. Here we go. We're almost done, guys. Art history is an academic discipline that seeks to reconstruct the social, cultural, and economic context in which an artwork was created. The basic goal of this work is to arrive at an understanding of art and its meaning in its original historical context. Art historians rely on a variety of documents and sources in order to conduct formal and contextual analyses. In addition to understanding context, art historians seek to describe the formal qualities of artworks, Important terms used to discuss the formal qualities of an artwork include line, shape, and form, perspective, color, texture, and composition. Artists throughout time have worked in a variety of media, including drawing, printmaking, painting, photography, sculpture, mixed media, performance, craft, and folk art, and architecture. 
All right, so that is it for section A, or sorry, video A. I hope you guys understood this content, and if you need to, you may have to study it because I will be testing you on it at our next meeting after school from 2.45 to 4.15 on Friday, January 20th. All right, see you again later, pentathletes. I will be posting the video for um, the second part, which is video B, on Friday, hopefully. Cross your fingers. Okay, bye.